Um, okay, so the speaker is going to be uh, Dr. Philip Beckemeyer from DLR, uh, who has kindly agreed to cover both topics on, on surrogate modeling. Uh, I am not going to delay his uh, excellent talk any further. Philip, what is yours? Thank you very much, speaker. Surrogate modeling, choosing the right tool for the job. So what's the baseline idea of surrogate modeling? We had the, the buzzword a few times before, I would say. So the idea is essentially if you have a black box model, like you can see here on the top, and you have some inputs that correlate to some outputs, no matter if uncertain or not. First of all, that's the situation. You put something in, you run or do something, you get something out. And the idea is if the black box model is expensive, let's throw it out of the window and let's put a surrogate model there instead and then you will get something. And in fact, I think we skipped that on the slide before, there was a quote from, from Fox who said, all models are wrong, but some are useful. So if you take nothing away from this at all, at least take the quote away, that pretty much says everything you need to know. Um, in the end, they do pri provide approximations of, of the reality mimicking physical models, or at least they provide a consistent representation of the information you have in data. It does not have to be first principles. You can also build a surrogate model purely on something that you have in table or form, something that you can make up. But it provides a consistent representation. They are typically used with data-driven bottom-up. So you do have data, you build a model on top, you use the model for whatever you want. Um, and then the input-output behavior is the only important element closely related to what we have before. The question is always, what is your black box model? Is the aeroelasticity simulation as a whole the black box model? Or is the aerodynamics a black box model that's connected to the structural as a black box model? This clearly alters the models you have, and that's a question the engineer has to decide for his purpose. Um, so, and the aim is always, you wanna be as accurate as possible for the application you have at hand, using as few evaluations as of the black box as, as possible. And then you, you pretty much get this consistent representation here. So in general, surrogate construction consists out of these three steps. If you do it in a practical thing, you select some sampling uh, locations where you actually run the full order model or the, the black box model. You construct the surrogate model and optimize the model using hyperparameters, nowadays also called training, if you come from the machine learning world. Uh, and then you evaluate the accuracy and select some additional samples to improve accuracy, always with the goal to be as accurate as possible for your application, as few function evaluations as possible. So first, a few words about the design of experiment. That pretty much means where you run a simulation, where you perform an experiment to collect data, where you can build your model upon. The general engineering approach in one dimension is you have from something from here to here, you put five points in it and you say you're good to go. You move to a second dimension, you end up with something like this. You move to a third dimension, you get end up with something like this. I think you know where this is this is getting you. If you have like 10 dimensions, this probably doesn't work out because you definitely have not used as few samples as possible. Uh, it's sometimes known as the curse of dimensionality, which pretty much means if you do a full factorial sample, so you combine everything with everything, you do a lot of simulations to simply collect data. So you would typically nowadays not do that if you come from a modeling background. Nevertheless, it's still common in a lot of engineering applications that they perform kind of fixed combinations of parameters into collecting information, which every now and then is not really helpful to build a surrogate model. Um, yeah, just a word of warning that we learned along the years. So uh, instead, you would probably do something like a Latin hypercube sampling. It's, I would say, the arguably most common approach in literature. Um, it's the idea is that you're space filling and there is a drawback, you're not able to add new samples sequentially. So if you design a Latin hypercube sampling for let's say 50 points, and then you realize hmm, 60 would have been great, you cannot reuse your initial 50 and just add 10 on top of it, which every now and then is a drawback, especially if you have very expensive function evaluations. There is a way around it, which is called low discrepancy quasi Monte Carlo. They are a similar idea, but they're deterministic at the end of the day. Meaning if you have 50 samples and you want to add 10, do another, keep the initial 50, add 10 more, and you got 60 at the end of the day. Honestly, they do not scale insanely great. So if you go to like 100 dimensions, you had funny patterns that look like a carpet that you can buy. So 
there are there are downsides to everything, but at least these are probably the two most common things that you can find in literature and that people generally do if they want to define sampling. Now, surrogate modeling, that was the actual title of the talk, and I will keep it to this one slide. First of all, there is an infinite number to surrogate models that you can use. And there is not the right surrogate model for everything. There is the right surrogate model you have to pick for your application at hand. I listed a few here, just to give you an idea. You could do some piecewise linear interpolation. That's super <coughs> simple. Everyone has seen that. Axel can do it for you. And in fact, if you have a lot of data, that's actually quite a great surrogate model. And I believe it's greatly used throughout engineering. If people want to omit it or not, I don't know. But generally, I would say quite a lot of people do this. You could also do polynomial interpolation. It's still a fairly simplistic method, but you have to preset the polynomial order. You might be able to capture some linearities. If you do a lot of polynomials and combinations, it becomes computationally expensive. You can do some radial basis function interpolation. So it's a kernel based method using radial basis functions. It can capture nonlinearities. There are various extensions available. And I would say it's a fairly commonly used method for surrogate modeling. There are tools out there where you can directly take a radial basis function model out of. There are Gaussian processes, uh, which is a model I will speak about a bit later. Also, also kernel based methods using a Gaussian kernel. It captures nonlinearities. There are various extensions available. And sometimes people say they have an inherent error estimator. As it is built up on a Gaussian model or a Gaussian assumption, there is an ability to assess the model for its variability at the end of the day, which is something you can nicely ex uh, exploit later on. Also for Gaussian processes, there are plenty of toolboxes out there that you can simply take and use. Wanted to add also neural networks because they are highly hyped lately. Um, so if you want to get some funding, write something, you do deep learning with neural networks, that improves your chances. Uh, they are probably the most popular machine learning method. They allow to represent pretty much every or complex function that you have at hand. On the other hand, there are very, very data hungry. So if you only have 10 simulations or a 20, probably don't build a neural network, even though it sounds fancy, uh, because the result is definitely going to be worse than all the other ones you have on here. And the training procedure can be tedious. While for piecewise linear interpolation, there is nothing to do except of pouring the data in. For neural networks, there is more to do. And then. There are more options available. In, in terms of uncertainty quantification, there is PCE, for example, that's highly used. There are combinations of this with dimensionality reduction techniques. The list is endlessly long. I think the takeaway message is, besides the all models are wrong, but some are useful, is pick the right model for your job and think about this. So, so better invest a day or two on picking the right surrogate model before moving ahead and then later on down the line realizing that the choice wasn't great and you could have known from the beginning on. Uh, and the following, I want to say a few words about Gaussian processes. Um, yeah, so essentially the idea is if you have a set of training points, there are potentially infinite many number of, of functions that fit the data. Um, and Gaussian processes assign a probability to each of these functions. And then you do some hyperparameter optimization and in the end, the mean of this probability distribution represents the most probable characteristic of, of the data. Uh, and then this approach allows to incorporate uncertainties that you have on the data as well, because you already have a probabilistic mindset. And it takes into account, an, or it provides an error estimation done in the interpolation. So assume this, this is your real function that you want to get. You put some design points on top of it. Uh, all these functions are, are going to fit these points, so there are quite a few of them. And then what the Gaussian process does, the mean of all these ones here, which is the, the black line, is the mean of the model. And then the variability, you can see that's the error estimation the Gaussian process model provides to you. Then you can take a look. It, in very simplistic words, it correlates to the lack of data. So where you do not have data, the model tells you I'm uncertain at this point due to lock, lack of data. So you can see here, there is obviously no point in here, so you have quite a high variability. And then here as well. Well, here where you do have data, uh, this works as well. You can incorporate, if you have some, some variability on the point itself, you can incorporate it in the data, which kind of increases the spread around the data point. Uh, 
if you have them. And then if you move from four points to six points to eight points, you're kind of able by exploiting this characteristic to improve the model later on for the task you want to do. And now in the remaining, slightly running behind four minutes, I want to speak about how to exploit this for uncertainty quantification. The, the upcoming bit now is pretty much independent of the model you pick. I will do it for the Gaussian process. But the idea is you want to propagate uncertainties from inputs to outputs. We have heard this quite a lot before. Um, and essentially, you want to use the surrogate model for it. Um, so if you would do a deterministic simulation, you would move from here to here, and that's the value you have. Then I think the, the common next step forward is doing something like multipoint. So you do a few points here, you move to the output, and then you already know more. Then in, a, in an uncertainty fashion, you define some input probability density function. You evaluate uh, the, the model at all these points. You get some output PDF. So and the idea is now let's replace the deterministic point here, or the, let's replace the, the model here with the surrogate model. So this is your full order model. The PDF, as we've seen on the slide before, you do a few DOE points. You put a model next to it, you can see it does fit the data points. It's, it's not that great, actually. Nevertheless, in the next step, you do some Monte Carlo sampling to propagate input to output. That's what you get. So you move your input PDF to your output PDF. As you can see, it obviously does not fit the actual one, but at least you get something, an approximation. Now, if you compute the standard deviation, you get something like this, and there should be another one for, for the real model. There is a difference between them. And maybe like this, the model is not very helpful. Nevertheless, you found a means with like four simulations to perform a full propagation from inputs to outputs, which is something that you weren't able before if you think that each of these points here cost 10 hours of simulation time, probably more. So now, as a next step, we typically use the Gaussian process with this error estimate that we've seen here. We ask this, and then we do an infill, pretty much asking the model, if you are free to choose the next point and you know the input PDF, where would you do another simulation to improve yourself? And then, I mean, you can guess it does a simulation there, which kind of moves it up there, and you're already significantly closer to it. So in general, if you speak about surrogate modeling, we highly suggest to do this adaptive approach. So do some initial sampling without any pre-knowledge, and then build an initial model, and then add a few samples to the mix to improve the model. This one works great for mean and standard deviations. There are other infill things which work better if you go for quantiles or extreme events. So that's pretty much the idea of surrogate modeling for the overall bit. And as I said, we generally use Gaussian processes for this. You can use also a regular basis function. I think also a neural network would work if you tweak it right and, and don't screw up the training. But yeah, that, that's that's the general idea of, of this. And then in the, we'll probably do a small break if someone has a question now, and then I would come to some practical examples. So because Philip is giving both talks in that session, we can perhaps break for questions. We have some time for questions. If Somebody has them, and uh, we move on to the next thought. Any, anybody? Don't ask anything complicated. So. <laughs> I, I suppose um, maybe I have a question. Then, um, <clears throat> can we? Do you think can we talk about uncertainty quantification with surrogates as well as uncertainty quantification for surrogates? So, how can we exploit what we've just heard today? to improve, well, not to improve, but to construct a surrogate that is that is capturing the uncertainty that is actually there. What do you think? Any, any thoughts on that? So, in, in, in the actual, I, so, so I, I in calibration. The, I see two aspects. First of all, I believe surrogates allow you to do some uncertainty propagation forward from input to output that you're simply not able to do without. And it comes at a cost. The surrogate is not perfect. And at some point, you have to account for, for that. To improve this a bit, the infill strategy is a practical way forward to address shortcomings of your surrogate model. Nevertheless, there will be an error to the surrogate model. There is the point where you speak about calibration. You could also use the surrogate model to move backwards so from outputs to inputs, similar relation. 
but it probably goes beyond the, the scope of the talk. I, I mean, I'm certain the calibration for the, for the series. So, so you showed in the only bare pictures the, the salmon color mm -hmm. maps cover the true function. What happens if, if you go one slide back? What happens if um, that that band doesn't cover the true function? So you, you know that, that's uncertainty. Kind of, that's what I call uncertainty calibration. Calibrating uncertainty to, 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 to capture what's possible and that possibility to be the truth. And are you not assuming that all of your is <laughs> sorry? Are you not assuming <laughs> that all your design and experiment points are truth? Whereas if it's experimental data or errors in the modeling, there's going to be some <coughs> uncertainty in those as well. So are there not methods that so the most so to keep it simple for this introductory bit here, I assume them as ground truth, so it kind of goes to zero here. But there are definitely methods, or we also have methods at hand where you can give an uncertainty to the to the value itself and then also account for that. In the end. Speaking in this picture here, it pretty much creates some some bound around yeah. this one here as well. Okay. So there is a risk of that. So pretty much, if you construct a bad surrogate, you constructed a bad surrogate. Yes. Um, how I see the error estimation here is it's supposed to give you a feeling where it's worth while looking closer. It's no guarantee whatsoever that your true value with will be within the bound. Mm -hmm. Of this, the hope, and I, I believe it's hope is the right word, is that you do some adaptive in the things, you, you move closer. There are various other ways to improve surrogate modeling, just to, to name a few buzzwords like multi fidelity modeling, where you derive trends from low fidelities. You can do gradient enhanced surrogate modeling, where you also exploit gradient. So that, that all goes into the field of surrogate modeling, where a lot of research has been done. I see it as a way to do something that you otherwise are not able to do at all, but it has to be taken with care. Again, that's where I see the engineer. As an engineer, you, you should be able to understand these methods and have a feeling about the implications that go along with it. And that's probably where we have to provide training to people in order to make them aware of these things. Yeah. Any further questions for this talk? Okay, I suppose then we just move on to the next one. Thank you.